but you know we've had a, a janitor get there you know making no more than 30 40k we've had several people come on our show that have you know been around that average American income around 50 grand that have got there we had an engineer I think he never made over 80 grand and he you know ended up at 7 million this show is dedicated to helping you strengthen your family tree and live financially free welcome to the marriage kids and money podcast everybody this is Andy Hill and today we're talking about what it takes to become an everyday millionaire there's a lot of mystique and myths about millionaires. How did they get all that wealth? Was it inherited? Surely a rich uncle died and left it all to them. Well, we're going to break through all those myths today, my friends, and talk to two gentlemen who have interviewed over 200 millionaires, and they're going to share with us the seven-figure truth. Clark Sheffield and Jace Mattinson are the hosts of the Millionaires Unveiled podcast, where they interview everyday millionaires. Stories included are those of doctors, lawyers, accountants, firemen, police officers, military members, real estate investors, and much, much more. Outside of the podcast, Clark and Jace are both CFOs, so dollars and cents are their full-time jobs and their side hustles. When they aren't talking to everyday millionaires and spending time with their families, these two love getting outside for a game of golf, biking, and skiing. Welcome to the show, Jason Clark. Hey, thanks, thanks for, for having, having us. us. Absolutely, guys. Thanks so much for being here. This is one of my favorite topics, how to become a millionaire. So I'm so glad you guys are here. You guys have a great show. I've had the chance to be on it. I'm excited to talk to you today. So you two interview millionaires for fun. It's like it's like your, your hobby, your side hustle, the thing you guys like doing in your spare time. What are some traits these people all have in common? So first that we always talk about is intentionality. Um, I think people are aware and intentional about what they're doing. Um, I, I don't think that always means that they've done it for their whole lives or started at a young age. Oftentimes they did get a late start. There's plenty of people that we interview that say, hey, I didn't really get into my finances until I was in my late 20s or early 30s or late 30s or even 40s. You know, a lot of them just say, hey, I was living paycheck to paycheck. I was doing this. I was doing that. And then I realized maybe there was a life event, whether it was kids, maybe it was a job loss, maybe it was a move, maybe it was a change in passion or they wanted to retire early and then they became intentional. So everybody that we interview now is aware and intentional. They're aware of what they spend. They're aware of where they stand. They're aware, they're aware of what their investments are in. And they're knowledgeable. I mean, it doesn't mean that they're always doing it themselves. A few have hired financial planners, but they're just very intentional with their behavior and their decisions. And they don't just live a lackluster life in all aspects of their life, not necessarily just financially. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. The it almost it almost requires a moment in time where somebody flips from unintentional to intentional. Did, did a lot of those happen? A lot of the stories, there was a moment I wasn't paying attention and now I am. Yeah. And some of them, I mean, that's one thing we ask is, hey, how did your upbringing affect where you're at today? Meaning, are these principles that you learned when you were younger? Is this something your parents taught you? A lot of the times it's yes. But a lot of the time I would say, Jason, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe it's 50-50 where they grew up in homes where their parents were terrible with money. And they say that. And it's a, it's a conversation with a coworker. It's they read something online. It's a life event. I'm trying to think if there's like a, a few life events that stand out. Um, everything from being homeless to like, I don't want to do this anymore, right? Like, I don't want to live this life to, you know, kids. And, and Dave Ramsey talks a lot about that. Like your I've had it moment with debt, right? Like, I don't want to live in debt anymore. And I think there's some of that to investing in. Once the snowball gets rolling, you start saying, I don't want to live like this anymore where I don't, where I can't invest, where I don't have money. So I'd say it's mix. Yeah, Jay, Jay, how about habits for these folks? Obviously, intentionality is important for getting a hold of your money. Were there any consistent habits that a lot of these folks had? In terms of habits, yes. Yeah. So it's interesting. It's interesting you ask about habits. You know, I think there's been a few books written on it, and right, there's not something that you know, a millionaire just wakes up and and, and becomes a millionaire. They definitely have strategies and habits that they form, but I wouldn't say that it's more as uniform as you would think. You know, there's not a you know, millionaire that's, Hey, I'm always up at 6am. And the millionaire that's, you know, work until, you know, that prefers working at night is, Hey, I go to bed late. I mean, we had stuff all over the board. You know, it's not like every single millionaire is clipping coupons. 
I wouldn't say that even every single millionaire is, you know, extremely frugal with their car purchases. Um, you know, we've had several that have bought nice new vehicles. We've had several that have bought even young millionaires that have bought luxurious vehicles. So the habits, I think, more have morphed, at least for our millionaires, more to their individual personalities and what works for them. I love it. Well, so I'm not doomed, I guess, if I don't get up at uh, 5 a.m. to uh, become a millionaire, huh? No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and it's budgets, too. I think Jay's touched on this, but a lot, most of the million. So this has probably been something that's been the most surprising to us is we'd say, what, Jay's 85, 90 percent of our millionaires don't live on a strict budget. So they're very aware yeah. of what they're I mean. They, but often, even when I ask, hey, how much do you spend annually? Like the first response on most of that is, oh, geez, I don't know. You know, I mean, some of them are like, oh, fifty thousand dollars. But a lot of them, I mean, I think Dave Ramsey, I think, pushes that like budget, budget, budget. And I think that's great to get out of debt. But most of the millionaires we've interviewed, whether it's net worth from one to 100 million, they're not budgeting. That's incredible. Yeah, I think that's a really good insight for a lot of people. You know, maybe it's the habits that get stuck after, you know, you figure out how to build wealth, how to create, you know, uh, abundance for yourself. And then over time, it's like, this is just how I live. So maybe the act of budgeting isn't as necessary. What do you think? Yeah, I think it definitely is an evolution. I mean, I wouldn't say that, you know, 80, 90% of our millions didn't have a budget at one time in their life. But some of that is evolved, developed the habits, and then decided, hey, I'm just going to put that away and, and, and move on because I've got the habits established where I can track my spending in my head, or maybe I'll review it, or I don't want to, you know, like I said earlier, you don't want to go over a category by $25 and have a freak out or have a big discussion with your wife one way or another. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about some of these myths, you know, that you hear out there. You guys have talked to over 200 of these folks now. Does a lot of their money come from family or inheritances? So I think we've had two inheritances um, that, that made somebody a millionaire. Um, one really early on in the show and then one other that I think was at like six or 700,000 and then his father tragically passed away early and that kind of put him over the edge, but he obviously would have got there anyway. I mean, he was in his late twenties or thirties and had $700,000. So I think it happens, but I don't think, I don't know. And I, I wonder too, how much people think that anymore. You know, I think you always hear that like, oh, they inherited their money. But I mean, we had one person that did. And they, and they said, yeah, I did. And this other kid that did, but was well on his way. So we haven't really seen it. Yeah. So that's, uh, really that's it. less than 1% out of, out of the 200 plus that you've had. Yeah. Then. So if that is still a myth out there, then let it be dispelled today. So <laughs> let, let's talk, let's talk about how these people have built their wealth. You know, I know, uh, that real estate can be a big part of that for people's journeys. So what are the type of routes that people can take that you've interviewed? Uh, to become a millionaire through real estate. Yeah, in terms of routes, I think like you hit on the one major one we see. Most of these millionaires own real estate, whether it's a personal residence and or rental properties. And in, in that, I would say a majority of the ones that do own real estate, for the most part, have you know a single family rental or a few small multifamily properties or a bunch of single family rentals. Some of them have had you know large portfolios of single family rentals. We do have a few that have, you know, gone the multifamily route or have become syndicators themselves. Uh, we do have a few that have also invested in syndications themselves, uh, you know, and I don't know that that's so much necessarily where they've made all their wealth, but definitely something that have become part of their portfolio over time. Got it. What does the syndication route mean? What does that mean? Basically, you're pooling money on investors to, to buy large apartment buildings or commercial properties. So, you know, I might throw in 25 grand, you would throw in 25 grand, we get a bunch of other people, we'd all throw in 25, 50, 100 grand or more to go buy a, you know, a 200 unit or 300 unit apartment complex. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. So you're, you're pooling your resources together to buy something larger that you couldn't do on your own. That makes sense. To break it down, I think this is, I think this kind of is the crux of your question is what, what are the buckets? So it's probably 50% of people that we interviewed, Jace, correct me if I'm wrong here, 50% of people are both in the equity market and in real estate. And when I say real estate, not just their primary home. So they have some sort of other real estate investment, whether it's a rental or a syndication. That's probably 50%, 40, 50%. 25, 20, 25% are about 100% in the market. 
So they don't have real estate. I mean, I mean, I'm excluding primary homes here. They have their primary home, but then everything else is just, hey, I go, I go into the market, whether it's retirement accounts, 401ks, Ross, or just traditional investment accounts. That's what they do. Another 25% would be all real estate. So they say, look, I don't understand the market. I'm not going to mess with it. And that's just what I want to do. I like real estate. I understand it. I know it. I feel like there's ad- advantages to it. I'm going to do all real estate. And then the remaining, you know, two or three percent or something else. So small business, for example. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, I'm I'm in the camp of all all equities right now. I mean, I, I own my own home, but I've stayed away from real estate just for the sheer fact of the work that's involved with it. And I realize that there's work uh, for the people that you know, have shied away from real estate that you've talked to. Is that part of the reason they've they shied away from it? Are there other disadvantages that we're not seeing when it comes to real estate? Yeah, I think you hit on it. I think it's twofold. I think one, we hear occasionally, look, I tried real estate. I had a rental and I realized it was work and I don't want to deal with it anymore. You know, I don't want to do it. It's not as passive as people make it sound. Even if I hired a property manager, they were calling me when something happens and a lot of that could just stem from a bad experience. I mean, that could be the fact wherever you buy too, but that could just be a bad experience. And then some people say, look, I don't understand it. I don't, you know, I don't understand. While, while the real estate investors say, I don't understand the stock market, the stock market investors say, I don't understand real estate, right? So I think it kind of goes, it goes two ways. So those are the two reasons we hear. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, so for the people that are investing or have a lot of their net worth, I guess, in the stock market, is a lot of it sort of your traditional 401k IRA kind of stuff, or is a lot of this non-retirement? Yeah, I'd say a lion's share, probably upwards of 80% of them that are invested in the market. 90 plus percent of what is in the market is in tax-protected accounts. We have had a you know guest time to time that have put together you know a taxable portfolio you know outside of tax-protected accounts. And part of that is either they filled up those buckets already or they're putting it there for, you know, some sort of long term purchase, whether it's a home or a business or real estate down the road or just another place for them to to kind of park some money. And they've been stock market investors. And as we know, there's limitations on, you know, putting that in tax protected accounts. So they'll put it in, in taxable. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of folks out there that want to get into investing, right? Quote unquote investing. It's often thought of as not investing if you're putting it in your workplace 401k or your IRA. Have you guys heard this sentiment? I haven't really heard that. I mean, I guess I can understand that. You feel like you're not really doing anything yourself. Is that the thinking? Well, I guess it's, I guess it's more of the thought that if I'm going to be investing, I'm looking for something that's got some aggressive growth and putting it away from my retirement for 40 years is snoozy and boring. But to to, to the point here with these interviews you guys have done, 90% of the folks are doing the snoozy and boring. Yeah. And I think there's an order of operations. I mean, Jason, and I always talk about that. Like, I mean, and you probably you talk about it too, I'm sure is take advantage of the free money. Right. And, and I, I get it. I mean, it's boring. It's boring, right? You stick it in an S and P total market index fund or whatever. And, and then you just watch it and maybe it goes up 10%, maybe it doesn't, you know, you have years like the last few, or maybe they cancel each other out. But I think there's an order of operations in, in what you do, but I get that. I mean, there's people that we've had that jumped into real, we've had two or three people that jumped into the real estate in 2008 and 2009 and went bankrupt and lost everything. And I think that, I think sometimes that sentiment gets people into trouble of, Hey, I just want to jump in here cause it's sexy and it's growing and it's, you know, I want the aggressive growth. But I think a good, I would say most all of these millionaires have a good baseline in their retirement accounts. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I like how you guys broke it down, that 25-25, and then they sort of split with that last 50 of both. Any other crazy ways people are investing their money outside of real estate or the stock market? Any other unique things that you guys heard? You know, we've had a few business owners from time to time. Those that have either started their own and grown it or have purchased the business and grown it and have, you know, substantial portion of their net worth and their business. You know, lately we've seen some more that are heavy in, you know, one or two stocks. For example, Tesla, we had an interview with a guy that had been pretty bullish on Tesla for several years. And obviously that's taken off on a rocket ship. And, you know, we are seeing more and more that, that do have a little bit of crypto exposure. You know, it might not be a lot. Uh, but there are definitely more and more millionaires that are popping up with that that have some crypto exposure. Wow. Yeah. I mean, having having a, a little bit of that, a little bit of other things is probably a good idea. I mean, from talking to these individuals, 
whether it's you know precious metals or Bitcoin or other or other things like that, individual stocks, does that make up a small portion of their portfolio? Yeah, I think it's small, but but yeah, precious metals, one that you just mentioned, that's one that we see more than I thought we would is gold and silver. And then the other interesting one, we haven't launched this episode, but we just interviewed a week or two ago is somebody had, this guy had 50 or $60,000 in, in baseball cards or sports cards. So every now, and, and I guess just full circle, it's interesting too, to see what people include in their net worth. Some people are like, hey, I don't count my house because it's the whole Robert Kiyosaki thing, right? Like, oh, it's a liability, it costs me money. And then some people count it all, right? Like house, cars, jewelry, TVs, like I'm putting it all in my net worth. And so, yeah, it's your point. I, I think it's interesting. You see the crypto, you see the gold and silver, you see the baseball cards, you see the Rolex watch, you see the Teslas. But yeah, nobody that we've, we haven't interviewed yet, somebody that, that's had Tesla or baseball cards or, or not Tesla, but crypto or something some alternative asset, right, is a large, large majority of their net worth. It's always below 5%. Hey, that's a good point. And then, and Jace, uh, I know you guys get very detailed with the net worth as you guys are interviewing your guests because I had the opportunity to be on your show. How do people value their businesses? Is that something you see on those uh, net worth charts? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and the ones that have done it, you know, they, they're obviously experts in their field and their space. And so it's a lot easier. Some of them get an annual review of, you know, a third party comes in, valuation firm. Part of it is for their net worth statement. Part of it's probably for their banks, line of credit, et cetera. And then some are just, hey, look, I think I could probably sell it for two times earnings or three times earnings, which, you know, in my opinion, is probably pretty fair. You know, you may be, depending on what revenue is, some of these businesses may only sell for their assets, but the ones we've had on our show are probably likely, you know, with their brand recognition, customer base, they're probably selling for two to three X. That's cool. That's cool. That's good to know. I mean, especially for the small business owners who are listening to this show and they are looking to, you know, potentially build their business to be something to sell in the future. Know that know that it has value. Absolutely. So, okay, let, let's talk about you guys a little bit, if you don't mind. So you guys have interviewed a lot of people. You've learned a lot probably over the past few years as you, as you guys have done these interviews. Have you modified any of your financial plans based on these interviews? So I'll make a plug for Jace episode. Jace, what episode were you? Look that up while I'm talking. But Jace was interviewed on the show. So if you want to hear specifically ah. about him, you can go. And then Andy, you mentioned yours. So Andy's episode was 170 on our show, if, if you want to listen to that. Um, I think yes and no. I've been, I've been surprised at how many people are not involved in small business. I thought we would see more of that. And candidly, maybe there is, and we just haven't had people on the show. I mean, now we're getting up close to like 250 interviews. So our sample size is getting a little bit bigger, but we're always trying to find people, you know, that's representative of, of everybody. But I think the, I, I've, I've been surprised. I'll get back to your question here at how many people don't invest in their HSA. And so I've been more aware in my plan. I mean, it's something I started before we started the show, but I've just been more aware of that element of it because you just hear all these things and very rarely do we have somebody with over a $10,000 HSA balance. And I, it's been surprising how many people don't invest in their Roths accounts either in the 401k or, or an IRA in a Roth. So I think I've become just more aware and I don't know that there's necessarily one right or wrong answer. I mean, everybody's done it so differently, but I think you continually hear these and you're like, man, why, like, why don't I invest in my HSA? You know, that's that's a great tax advantage to count. Let me think about that a little bit more. And anyway, it's just interesting. That, that is interesting. And I, and, I, and I wonder if it's just based on the the time that it's been popular or around. Like HSA, I mean, how, how long has that been around or available? In the last 10 years? And then Roth? Yeah, it's maybe like a what, decade. Yeah. And then Roth, what, like maybe? 2025. 20, exactly. And then 401k yeah. has been around since, you know, the 70s. So yeah, is, yeah. Is, it just, is it just the time, you think? Yeah, I think that has a factor. It's just the the, you know, the the adoption of it is just slower. People don't quite understand it as much. There's education that goes into it, and then even when people do have an HSA, there's all sorts of other strategies around. Do you do you actually spend out of that every year for healthcare, or do you say, hey, look, this could be a really good investment and retirement vehicle down the road for myself as it continues to compound. And as long as I use it for healthcare, I mean, this, these accounts could grow pretty substantially. 
Yeah, it's a great point, you know, and, and the HSA seems to be changing, uh, not, I don't want to say daily, but every once in a while it's changing. Like you can, I, I don't want to say this incorrectly, but I think you could buy sunscreen with your HSA debit card now yeah. based on some <laughs> yeah. changes that happened, I yeah. think, in the CARES Act. So uh, things have been changing even over the last year. So uh, how about how about you, Jace? Has anything changed for you as you've, as you've been doing these interviews? Anything uh, as part of your plans? I think just doing these interviews is really like Clark said, made me more aware, but I've also really honed in on my personal strategy and, and really tried to maintain basically what I call a three bucket strategy. So I basically focus a third of my net worth and a third of my capital deployment into what was and what has been, you know, traditional market equity investments. And, and obviously I can't completely control that, but that's, especially since I've been investing in, in some of those since I was a teenager and then a third into real estate and a third into business. And as, as time has gone on and I've gotten older, I'm definitely going to probably be a little more weighted in business and real estate uh, until, you know, in terms of capital deployment, not necessarily that'll mirror my net worth per se, but in terms of capital deployment, that's just basically what I've decided for myself in terms of wanting to have you know, some diversity and one, keeping things interesting for myself. I really enjoy business. I really enjoy real estate. And it's fun for me to, to kind of play that game more than necessarily trying to like, you know, strive for that absolute highest net worth possible. Uh, I think there's definitely possibility in, in business and real estate to do that. But those things are more tangible for me and a little bit more fun. And if I don't quite make as much, you know, on one deal or not, because, of one reason or factor or another out of my control or even in my control. And instead of investing in the market, oh, well, but at the same time, I kind of just, you know, I feel like I've got enough exposure to, to public equities and things that I don't completely have control over. And so I've kind of brought some of that more capital deployment, you know, underneath my own control and umbrella and whatnot. And I think the other thing too, is it's been pretty consistent trying to keep, you know, my cash levels and my primary residence equity under a certain level, you know, we haven't seen many that have been over 10, 20% between those two. And I've really tried to, to kind of mirror that, especially the ones that have gotten, you know, more and more, you know, on along their journey in their fifties and sixties, they've really mirrored keeping that 10 to 20% home equity cash. I think that's great. And I think you made a really good point. Almost, uh, it made me think about my point earlier when people are calling, investing for your retirement kind of snoozy and boring, I think you, you, you were saying, hey, well, you know, because I'm just going to kind of put it on automatic for, for my retirement, I'm going to put some more of my time, my interest, and some of my money towards the things that do bring me joy, that are making me interested, and that, that being your, you know, real estate side of thing and business. So maybe there is something a little bit to, uh, you know, throw in your money towards the things that make you happy today. And then yes, let time and compound interest do its thing for your retirement down in the future. So where, where are you guys? I mean, we got to ask you, you guys are interviewing millionaires all the time. Where are you guys in your millionaire journey? Can we start with you, Clark? I'm not there yet. I wish I was. I'm not there yet. Well, what um, are you going to do to get there? I'm just staying the course, man. I'm kind of, I think I'm the same as Jace trying to get into three different buckets. Um, just try to aggressively save. And, but I, I also think it's worth living a little too. You know, I think over the last few years, I've, I've probably become a little less frugal, um, as I've saved and, and felt like I'm in an okay situation to do that. You know, I never would have taken big trips straight out of college when I had no money, but after a while you start running some calculations and you're like, all right, if I get there, a couple of years later, that's okay. I love it. So, so what are you do? What are the avenues that you're taking to, to build wealth for the future right now? So I do just the traditional investments, whether that's retirement accounts and a Ross or my wife, Ross HSA or traditional market investments. Um, I'm in some real estate syndications. I don't own any real estate yet. I live in New York city, so I don't own a house or personal rental properties, but have real estate syndications and then hoping to be involved in a, a food franchise, a dessert franchise in the future. So that's kind of the first small business piece for me. That's great. So, so Jace, when, uh, when Clark hits the, the mark, are you going to interview him on the show? Oh yeah. We if, gotta I bring him. Him on. if I let him. If you let him. him. <laughs> <laughs> got to get him to do his million dollar holler. There you go. Oh, I like it. There you go. 
I love it. All right, gentlemen. Well, so somebody's listening right now, and, you know, I guess we didn't really talk about salary very much, and they're thinking, you know what? I don't make a very high salary. I don't think I'm ever going to become a millionaire. What would you say to them? You know, it's a good question, and it's a good concern, but at the same time, we have had so many episodes with so many that have never made six figures. So we know it's possible, for one. Obviously, that the, the bigger you know, shovel, salary, more money coming in can allow you to, to get there possibly sooner. But, you know, we've had a, a janitor get there, you know, making no more than 30, 40 K we've had several people come on our show that have, you know, been around that average American income around 50 grand that have got there. We had an engineer, I think he never made over 80 grand and he, you know, ended up at 7 million. Obviously it was late in his sixties. Uh, but you know, that's just the power of compounded interest and sticking with a plan and investing for 40 years, you know, Warren Buffett's famous for making, you know, like 99% of his wealth after his 50th birthday. And it's probably going now to his 60th, birth, 60th birthday. Right. So to those people that, that don't feel like they're going to make enough to ever get there, stick the course, you'll get there. It just might take a little bit longer than somebody who is making more, or even if you were to make, you know, double what you're making and then concentrate on trying to you know grow that income you know we had a lot of millionaires come on that talk about hey i never thought i was going to make what i am making but they're really focused on growing that income providing value to to the marketplace and they were paid for it i love it well that's a good message so clark you know somebody's listening right now and they're like hey i am jacked up i want to make this happen i want to hit seven figures what is the first step that they should take following this interview well, I think first is just make sure you're allocating correctly. So take advantage of your free money. Um, to me, after that, I think it goes to the HSA, which I think everybody's going to use at some point in their life. And then probably a, a Roth IRA. I mean, I'm bullish on the Roths. I think some people question that, knowing where taxes are going to be in the future. But I, I just like having money invested that I don't have to pay taxes on and worry about in the future. And so I think getting that that baseline is, is where you want to start. Um, we had one millionaire that came on and, and he said, when I was 30 years old, I was impressed by people that were making a hundred thousand dollars. When I was 40 years old, I was impressed by people that were a millionaire. Right. And he's like, now in my fifties, I'm impressed by people that have passive income and are living off their cash flow. So I think, you know, Jace talks about a lot on the show is that we're all in a sense trying to chase passive income whether it's from our real estate investments. I mean, even if you invest 100% in the market, at some point you're going to pull out of the market to live on that money. That's where you often hear the 4% rule, your withdrawal rate. Um, and so I think just being aware of that, right? What's creating cash flow for you? What do you want to get to in the future? If you want to live off 50 grand, okay, what do you need to do to create that $50,000 of passive income? Maybe it's $200,000 you want to live on, right? So take the steps to get to there. That's what I'm trying to focus on. And I think millionaires that we've interviewed, they realize that's what brings them happiness, flexibility and freedom and relationships. And that's what they're after now, nearly all of them. And so I, I just, that's made me aware of my behavior, my decisions. And I think if you're saying, hey, how do I start now? It's that. Realize what's important to you and, and back into how you're going to get there. I love this message, everybody. There's no one right way to become a millionaire. There are multiple ways to do it. And these gentlemen have talked to over 200 folks that have done it. So where can people listen to this great podcast? Yeah, we're on all you know typical outlets, iTunes, Stitcher, uh, Spotify, Millionaires Unveiled is the name of the podcast. Millionairesunveiled.com is our website. And we got some new features on our on our new website too. If you want to you know voice in a, a question, we'll ask live on the show to our millionaires and stuff coming up. So super exciting stuff. We're on all social channels. You can reach out to us, uh, email millionairesunveiled at gmail.com. And Clark and I actually read and respond to all of them. Excellent. Well, this is a great show, everybody. I, what I like about it is, you know, in the spirit of this show, too, we want to try to be open and honest. So this is not a mystery for a lot of people. When you break it down in the way these guys do on their show, it becomes a little bit more obvious about how you can also follow a path to become a millionaire. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Andy.